Hello and welcome to There's No Business Like, a podcast where friends and industry colleagues explore topics and interview leaders in our industry of professional theatrical touring. Hey, everybody. Thanks for coming back to There's No Business Like. I'm Brian Zelmer, director of KU Presents at Kutztown University, and I'm joined with my friends, Kevin. Kevin Maynard from Quad City Arts. And Josh. Josh Benson from Marion Cultural and Civic Center, rocking it out in Marion, Illinois. And Danielle. Oh, hi. I'm Danielle Van Hook from the Alden in McLean, Virginia. And Katie. Hi, everyone. Katie Miller with the Midland Center for the Arts in Midland, Michigan. So, guys, I'm just curious... Have you guys ever wandered into a booth of an agency that you've never done business with before or didn't know before you went to that conference? And if so, like what lured you into the booth? At one point, there was an agency that had little bottles of vodka. They weren't supposed to have them, but they did. (laughs) Yes. Oh, yeah. (laughs) And they they had like put their own paper labels over the actual label and like relabeled the the little like airline bottles for themselves. It was very successful. I mean. It was because you remember it too. (laughs) Yes. Don't remember much after that, but it was fun. <laughs> I must have stopped and wandered into that booth at least 20 times. <laughs> <laughs> um, Brian, I would, oh gosh, I'm trying to think back. I think one of the things that caught my eye that I really remember once was somebody had a, a really nice video display kind of behind, and it was like a video of marimba within like... It, they were like playing the marimba upside down or something. So it was like, it really <laughs> caught my eye because <laughs> I, I was like, I've never seen that before. I need to go talk to these people. Interesting. Yeah. Nothing that's more compelling than candy <laughs> because like yeah. I've, I've been in, I've been mid sugar crash <laughs> and I mean that Snickers bar changed my life. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, I have been lured in to a booth that had a promise of candy attached to it when I've been mid crash. <laughs> Um, and you know what? Snickers bar perked my life back up. Um, so even if, even if it's cheesy, some, sometimes things no, that's, like that work. That's perfect. Yeah. I, I was lured into a booth for a, a magic wand, specifically one that like pops up, like expands out of a little, little like balled up thing. And it makes a, a full size magic wand. So you have like a mini magic, uh, trick that drew me in pretty quick. Cause I saw it pop out of the hand and I went, I need that. <laughs> that sounds really cool. <laughs> Well, the reason why I ask that is because I was lured into Stephen Sunderland's booth for something pretty special, which you'll have to take a listen to the interview to hear it. Uh, so I sat down with Stephen Sunderland of Vital Theater Company. Here's our conversation. Hi, I'm Steve Sunderland. I'm the producing artistic director of Vital Theater Company. We are based in New York. We started about, about 24 years ago. And uh, we recently set up shop in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. So we're producing out of both locations right now and still recovering from the uh, from the pandemic. So we're we're trying to get back on track here for the 22, 23 season. So great. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you. Um, I want to start out by asking you which hat you kind of consider yourself when you go to places like APAP because they classify people by agents, managers, consultants, producers. Is there a certain hat that you we are a producer? And we are also, quote unquote, an artist. So it's kind of a term that they don't always have when you have to select it when you go to these conferences. It's called a self-represented artist. A lot of times artists don't have an agent. They don't have a manager. They represent themselves. We have had external booking agents. We have had internal booking agents. Uh, so we're kind of considered a, a self-represented artist. And, and I'm the producing artistic director, but since our last booking person, booking director left, I've kind of assumed that position. So when I go to the conferences, I'm assuming the, the, the role of a booking agent for my, for my company. Now, would it be fair to say that um, to call you a theater company? Yep. We are a professional theater company. That's kind of the core of what we do. I uh, was an actor, and then I became a director, and then I became an artistic director, and, and, and so now I run a company that provides an opportunity for artists to do their work in theater. So, uh, and we've kind of, we've, and when we started out, we did drag cabaret, we did one act operas, we've had probably dozens of plays, original plays that have gotten published and produced that we created. And about 15 years ago, and we've always done family theater. We've always done theater for young audiences. And about 15 years ago, we came across a book called Pinkalicious, and we made a musical about that. And what we do is we hire a professional composer, book writer, lyricist. We create a musical, one-hour musical, with adult actors performing for children. And that became our chorus line. It's still, to this day, one of our most successful shows. And we kind of morphed into a family theater. So now we do professional, we do 
family theater, book-based, one-hour musicals with professional adult actors performing for children and their families. I want to dig a little deeper into how you do that and some of the business behind that. But before we do, I just want to back up because you mentioned a litany of uh, different job titles that you've had. And if maybe you could just briefly just touch real quick about what each one of those are responsible for. You mentioned artistic director or this and that. Yeah, that's a good question. I think people don't know what that means, especially in the theater world. You know, there's a lot of titles. And I, I, I notice people like executive producing, artistic director, and there's all kinds of variations. But what I see it is, is in a in a successful theater, you have an artistic side and an executive side. So someone has to be the visionary who has to be able to, especially when you're creating work, what works do we want to create? How are we going to create those? What artists are we going to use? And that's, for me, as coming from an actor and a director, that's a very creative part of the process, and I enjoy that immensely. But then on the other side, you need an executive or a managing director who's someone who's responsible for the budgeting, the fundraising, the staffing, the kind of all that administrative stuff. So, so that's the two roles. And then as a producing artistic director, since we have had and not had managing directors over time, uh, I'm the producing artistic director. So I kind of wear both hats, which is a lot of work. Maybe if you could just kind of give us the high 30,000 foot level um, idea of what how, how you produce shows, because you need to get the rights to these books that you're doing. And Well, this is a really interesting topic. I have learned so much as a theater professional that I never knew existed or knew knew how to do. And, you know, I'm kind of self-taught. I, I, I tell this story that when I was in college, I was a theater major. I was studying acting. I was in all the plays. I didn't have a lot of money, so I had to do work study. And my work study job was in the scene shop. So I ran the scene shop. I did electrics. I did lights, sounds. I did everything but costumes. I don't do, I mean, I'm starting to do a little sewing now, but I'm not a costume person. And then I would go to work at my, I would rehearse, I'd go to my, my, my work study job, and then I would go to the pizza place where I worked at night. So I was constantly working or in class or in rehearsal. And when I started my theater company in New York, I, I was not happy about having to work all the time, but when I started my theater company in New York, all of those skills that I had learned in my work study job were invaluable to me. I mean, every single day I was using some of those skills. The other thing is I know how to program HTML, CSS, I know how to write databases, I know how to do you know websites, marketing, advertising, and all that's been on the job training. I mean, we've had outside people do it. I'm not a graphic designer, but I can use Photoshop, I can use Illustrator, not very well, but I can you know, do things. Uh, and one of the things in terms of producing theater is, is we, when, for the children's theater especially, uh, we would always do original plays. So we never did book-based theater because it seems like everybody was doing book-based. But once we did Pinkalicious, which was based on a book that was brand new at the time, I found the value of having the marketing and advertising of a major corporation, whether it's a TV show or a, a, a publishing house, that brought our audiences in. And they marketed the show better than we could ever with our nominal budgets. So that then involved getting the rights to these things. So we've done shows like Fancy Nancy, Angelina Ballerina, Pinkalicious was a brand new title at the time, but now it's a monster. It's been around for its, you know, millions of books in print. So you have to go to the people that own that. It's called the underlying rights. You have to get the right to do that, and then you hire a book, and you have to pay for that, and then you have a certain term, and then you hire a book writer and a composer and a lyricist, and then you have to do a contract with them, and then ideally those merge, the underlying rights and the, the musical, the, the dramatist work merges to become an entity which you see in your scripts when you, you know, when you go to Samuel French or something. And then we produce them as a show in New York, if they're successful, we offer them to tour. So when I go to the conferences, I offer these shows. And right now we have five shows. And Pinkalicious, after 15 years, is still one of the top ones. And then the other, the third component is licensing, which we've started doing now. We've started executing contracts with our artists to license their shows. Because we had a lot of the big licensing agents would pick up our scripts. But then I'd get their catalog, and we're like on page 324, you know, third picture from the bottom. And we didn't, you know, some of them do well. But I thought, well, we could do a better job of marketing that. So we've started doing that, and that's been quite successful. We had a big three-year production in China, and uh, we have a show called Fancy Nancy that we've licensed all over the country, uh, and that's been very successful. I am curious too. how um, how you work out these these deals with all these people you have to pay before you even hit the road or sell your first ticket. There's a lot of upfront cost. Are you getting funders? Are you just working out deals with them so they get paid later? How does that work for someone looking well, to do that? Well, that's, that's a good question. Very good question because funding is all, I mean, any business is, you know, where's the money come from? How do you make the money? Uh, uh, I have to say this, that Vital in its 25-year history, our top, our peak revenue was about $2 million a year. 
we generated 95% of our revenue through ticket sales, touring, and merchandise, and about 2%, 2 to 5, 5, 5 2 to 5% uh, through funding. Uh, and we've had very, very extensive education programs. Fortunately, after 25 years, 24 years, we've got a fantastic track record. We do this like, you know, this is something that we we are very, very good at. And fortunately, we've been lucky to have some really terrific shows. So Nice. I, I want to step back a minute and just think you gave us some of your own personal background, mm -hmm. mentioned some of the jobs you had and so forth. But um, when did you first get the theater bug? Like, when did this... Was there a moment or did it kind of just gradually grow? Well, it's, you know, that's an interesting story. People ask me that a lot. I was in, I don't know, seventh or eighth grade and I had to give a speech in science class. And my grandfather and my father collected coins. So I was going to do uh, a speech about coin collecting. And I brought in some coins and I get up in front of the audience and I'm mortified by it. And I start to give this speech and I said a word that was wrong and I was mortified that I said that. And by the end of my, I don't know, it seemed like the speech lasted 100 years, but it's probably like five minutes. My mouth was so dry, I felt like my lips were stuck to my teeth. And I was just like, I, I thank you. <laughs> and I've never felt so horrible in my life. And I'm like, I can never feel like that. So what can I do? And I decided to take a speech class. There was a teacher that taught speech. And well, I took the class and I signed up and I, you know, and she goes, oh, she goes, have you ever thought about theater? I'm like, no, what's that? And so she was, you know, she put me in a theater class and that's how it started. And I fell in love with it. And I started doing local theater and, you know, community theater and things I did. Now, my high school used to do a junior class musical and a senior class musical and a play. But for some reason, when I got in a junior class, they didn't do one. When I got in a senior class, they didn't do one. And uh, so I did a lot of community stuff. And then I went to college and uh, did theater, but never thought I'd make a career out of it because, you know, I just never thought of it. And then finally, I, I, I was telling you earlier, I, I started at Bloom, uh, Mansfield University. We were both my parents went to school and met. And then I transferred to Bloomsburg. And when I transferred to Bloomsburg in my third year, I declared major. And then I moved to New York right after that. And I've been there for over 30 years now. Did you have a network or some kind of support system in New York? I had a friend who lived in Connecticut. I went to New York on a reconnaissance mission, took the bus from Williamsport, Pennsylvania, the Greyhound. No, it's Greyhound. It was Trailways at the time. And on the bus, I met a kid I was in junior high with who was a, the big theater kid. He was in all the shows. We were I was the tech guy in, in junior high. So we knew each other and he lived there. He was working for Henson Puppets. And uh, and he said, listen, if you ever move, you can live with me. So I, so a week later, I went to with my friends in Connecticut and drove back to Pennsylvania with him. And then a week later, I called him up and said, hey, can I stay with you? And he let me stay with him for a month. I had $200 in my pocket and a bag on my shoulder. And that was 30 years ago. What was the learning curve like? And how did you um, get off the ground? Well, I, I, when I was in college, my my senior year, I had one professor that had a little bit of professional experience, and there was a conference in New York, and it was at NYU, and it was called Bridging the Gap Between University and Professional Theater. And I went to this conference, and it blew my mind about how much I did not know about theater. And I'm like, oh my God, I have to get to New York. I have to start training. And there was a woman there who spoke, Sonia Moore. She was a student of Vartongov's, the third, uh, Stanislavski's third studio. And she married a wealthy, uh, you know, Russian czar and was here in the U.S., but she was teaching, teaching, uh, you know, an extension of the Stanislavski technique, which I was very enamored. I was very enamored of, of actor training, the method and all that stuff. So I wrote her a letter and she uh, said, yes, you can come study when you come to New York. So that was my plan. I moved to New York. My friend taught me how to ride the subway, taught me how to get around. I got a job at a pizza place because that's where I worked in college. And then I started classes and I just, and you just start making, you know, there's all young actors and training and I did speech class and theater class and drama class. In all of the sectors of our business, of our industry, uh, it's very important to have connections and networking and, and meeting people that kind of help you do what you do because almost none of us can do this alone. Uh, we don't live on an island. I'm just curious, how did you go about developing your early people that, that helped, you know, get you all of the other titles that you talked about before. Uh, that, that's a good question. You know, I don't know if people realize that, that it's your connections. Like yesterday, I, there's been a couple of connections. Like I went to look at an office at a theater in New York 
And I mentioned that I do, I also do publicity marketing and advertising. I've done shows for off and off Broadway and Broadway shows as part of my day job during when I was coming up. And I mentioned that I did that. And the producer at this theater said, oh my God, we need someone to do our advertising. And I got a job and I've been working for them for three, you know, as on a side job for like three years. And just the other day I met with someone uh, totally random about something else. And she, and I told her I'm in theater. She goes, oh my gosh, I'm a fundraiser. She's an executive le executive director level person. And I'm probably going to hire her to work for my company. So. Uh, connecting to people in ways that you can't imagine is just, you know, the person that you're going to school with now may be an executive director. Um, uh, you know, they're going to be in a position. I had a stage manager I worked with years ago in a dinner theater, summer theater. And out of the blue, he calls me. He's an artistic director of a theater. He goes, hey, Steve, I need a role. And without even auditioning, I, I, that's happened twice where people have called me out of the blue and said, hey, I got a role for you. Come down and do it. And no audition and just showed up and collected the check. So relationships are paramount. You also are a self-represented artist, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. which means you book the shows too, correct? Yes. And so in a way, you're your own agent. I just wanted to know what is your style? Because in our industry, a lot of people talk about, you know, that there's kind of two primary ways, the transactional method or the relationship building method. Some people use a mix. I'm just curious what your approaches. Yeah, yeah. Selling. well, the selling, you know, it's interesting uh, because the conferences, if you don't travel to the mall and we go to most of them, have their own kind of personalities. Like some people are scared to death. Like I never thought I'd be a salesman, quote unquote, like that just scares me, you know. But, you know, first of all, it's one of the most lucrative roles you could do, you know, because there's no limit to the amount of money you could make if you're a good salesman. But when you believe in your product, which I do, which are these shows that I create, um, it's easy to do that. In terms of transactional relationships, I think, you know, since we've been around for so long, people know us, we're established, they know we've got good work. I have other presenters that can contact new presenters and say, oh my God, Vital, we love them. Their, their team shows up, they do a great job, the shows are good, they sell well, you know, all that sort of thing. So I think, um, uh, my style is is just letting people know I don't you know there's a there's a salesman there's salesmen that like grab you by the lapels and like buy my stuff and I hate that we you know the, the legitimate folks in this industry hate it presenters hate it it's funny um, somebody said that uh, at one of the conferences I swear that I saw people walking down the aisles of the conference and they wouldn't make eye contact because they were afraid you were going to pit buttonhole them uh, and there are there are people like that. They're just like sharks. Like they just kind of lunge on on potential clients. My thing is like, hey, here's what I'm selling. Are you interested? Do you do family theater? Do you do this type of programming? And and you know we've been pretty successful at that. And but the problem the the point is is you have to do good work. If you show up, you do good work. Your team's good. You know you're going to have repeat business. Absolutely. I guess we should get into conferences a little bit now. So there's APAP, which we've talked about on this podcast before, the Association of Performing Arts Professionals, and that's probably the biggest one out there. But there's a lot of small regionals. There's ones that are uh, topical. They're, you know, all different kinds. Um, how do you go about choosing which ones? And, and when you were first entering this industry, how did you discover them? How did you plan for them? I'm sure if you're like everyone else, you made mistakes early on. You know, did you get mentors right away? If you could just kind of talk a little bit about that on a general. I went and I got a pass to go. I didn't get a booth. I didn't do anything absolutely overwhelming. And I tell everybody this the first time you go, just go and get the lay. There's three floors. There's hundreds and hundreds of booths and people selling and showcases. And but the conferences are where the buyers and sellers meet, where the presenters go and the, the artists and the ma managers and agents go to transact like, hey, here's my show. I'm looking for this type of show, jazz, theater, music, comedy, magic, I mean, you name it, they're out there. So there's a whole circuit that usually starts in August with usually it's um, I'm trying to think what's first. There's there's each region has one. So there's Western Arts Alliance for the West. There's there's Arts Northwest for the Pacific Northwest. So those are kind of smaller theaters, lower budgets. Um, and then you have Ohio, the Ohio Performing Arts Network. And then you have different states. There's Wisconsin. You know, some of these do conferences, some don't. Uh, there's no North Carolina. Presenters Conference does a fantastic job, and they do a great job of block booking, which means that if one presenter picks a show, they reach out to the other presenters in their area, say, hey, I'm going to do this show. And I went to, the first time I went to North Carolina, I did a five-minute pitch on my show, and we booked two weeks of work, uh, which is amazing. And then we've done showcases where we fly our cast out, we do a 15 minute production and didn't book anything. <laughs> so, you know, talk about making mistakes. Those are expensive mistakes, but you know, you try it and see. So these are conferences that you start in August, 
and then they continue almost every other week. There's one called IEBA, which is the International Buyers, IE, International Entertainment Buyers Association, which used to be kind of rock and roll and country, but now performing arts centers are coming for that. And actually, Arts Midwest was a very big secondary regional conference, which went out of business suddenly, surprisingly. And they are actually adding a Performing Arts Center, uh, PAC, Performing Arts Center Day at their conference this year. So they're adding an additional day so if people can come in for that. Um, and then there's uh, Pennsylvania Presenters, which we're here for to go to Steel Stacks and uh, Bethlehem today. And uh, so these smaller ones, it's like any, my, you know, you asked about how my sales, anytime I can be in the room with somebody who buys, you know, potentially could buy my show is invaluable to me. I mean, I went to, oh, Concert, the Consortium of Eastern Regional Theaters. It's like New Jersey, Connecticut, New York. I went to that, comp. they do, you know, they do a half day or a full day thing every once in a while. And I went to that, I don't know, a month or two ago and I sold three shows. Three guys came up to me and said, hey, Steve, it's time to do a show, let's do a show. And I booked three shows right there at the conference, so. That's great, so what do you say to somebody who wants to do what you do? Um, they kind of have an idea how to start or, or they're getting their connections made, but they are now ready to go to their first conference. Should they expect that they're right away going to sell something or is there? Oh, absolutely not. You know, you mentioned mentoring. Um, all of the conferences, and some do it better than others, have a mentor program. And I always sign up for that because there's nothing, I mean, I love sharing my knowledge and there's nothing better than having someone to show you the way because it's very, you know, it's, it's, it's confusing, it's, it's overwhelming. So find a mentor, go to the, you know, go to one of these things. Now I noticed, I can't think of the guy's name. There's a guy that does a university presenter who brings students. He actually gets money to bring his students. And I love it when I see that. And these kids, you know, we're there to sell my show. I'm there to sell, do business. But if I'm not busy and a kid walks up, a young student walks up, I'd, I'll have a conversation with them. And a couple of you can tell the ones that are interested because they ask good questions. And I'm, you know, I, I, I'll give them my card and say, hey, if I can ever help you out, let me know. You know, they may become an intern. They may become a staff member. They may become an employee. So, And my theory is that everybody in the performing arts field that does what you do, the presenters, agent, man, started on stage somewhere. So almost every one of us, myself included, well, I was an actor, they were a musician, they played, like some of these guys are like the music guys, they were concert pianists or concert musicians. And now they just found a way. So, and I tell students this, is to take a class in something that you never thought you'd been interested in, because there is so much out there in the world that would fascinate you that you don't even know exists. So in terms of if you're an arts major or you're an arts management major, and there's a desperate need for really good, solid people in arts management. You know, there's actors are a dime a dozen. I was one of them, I know. But but arts management folks that know, and especially if you have a business sense, if you're good with budgets, you're good with numbers, you're good with, you know, now young people all live on social media. That's the way of the world for marketing. Now, nobody, almost nobody does print media anymore. It's all, you know, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. So uh, there's a lot of opportunity. Uh, I'm just curious what your thoughts are on some of these uh, traditional things such as eating in the theater and taking pictures or video during a show and, um, you know, all these different things that are sort of, sort of in different parts of the industry changing where artists are, are wanting people to take video and pictures because they're finding that they're getting more ticket sales for their shows, whereas other ones are still very adamant. No, there's absolutely no photography or anything. Well, you're bringing up an interesting point because that has to do with the unions. God forbid you take a picture of their set and then you're gonna go home and recreate it. We all have a digital production studio in our pockets now. Everybody does. You cannot prevent that. If you are gonna to come to my show, I don't want you to record the whole thing, but you know, you look at these pictures from concerts. Nobody's watching the concerts anymore. They've got their phones up, they're recording it. Eating in the theater is still, that's a problem because of mice, rodents, you know, disturbing your neighbors. Inevitably, somebody brings a, lunch, a paper lunch bag with a sandwich in it, and in the middle of the show, they crinkle the paper, they open the sandwich and they start eating it. And that is annoying. So eating popcorn or anything like that, is annoying. I mean, bring, you know, now they're selling sippy cups, you know, they're for, I don't know, $15 for a glass of Pino Grigio on Broadway. So, you know, anything to make money, but, but eating is a problem. But I think the digital stuff with recording stuff, taking pictures, have at it, you know, because you're going to be able to market my show. You know, we do a show called Pinkalicious the Musical. Google that on YouTube. There are probably dozens of full length productions that you can see from five year olds all the way up to, you know, professional productions. Just for so. the record, I actually booked that with you when I was in New Jersey at a different venue. That was way back. That was way. That was. I think that was back in the beginning. And I think that's when I first met you and talking to kind of bring everything together. If I remember correctly, what brought me into your booth was I was doing APAP. They have these three huge floors for people who haven't been there called the Expo Hall. 
And it's exhausting for presenters like me that are out there buying the shows, going from booth to booth to booth for hours. And I tend to get dehydrated. I try not to. I know that's a threat. But I just remember I was getting very low energy. And I happened to look at your table. And I think you had a bunch of little cupcakes. Is that Pinkalicious loves cupcakes. She loves to pink. She has a wand. It's, you know, Google it. It's it's adorable. It's, and the artist is amazing. Amazing talented artist. Talented artist. But I don't know how we came up with this. Well, we used to do it at our show. We would sell cupcakes. We sell wands and t-shirts and all this stuff. And people would walk into our show and like, is this a birthday party? No, it's just a show. So we said, oh, we should do that. So we would get mini cupcakes. And every conference, we were the cupcake. Everybody knew us because of the cupcakes. It was a great marketing thing. It got me to your table. One of the things that we I pride myself is, and we are very, very savvy marketers. We actually had a Broadway producer call me and says, who does your marketing and advertising? Because we love it. And I said, we do it in house. Go a little further into marketing. Um, what is your approach when you're starting a new show? You've got a process where you're, okay, we're going to do the show in two years. We're going to start selling it. How do you have a, a kind of a cookie cutter approach now? Or do you? Absolutely. Absolutely. Very, very strong. Uh, you know, and this is like in any industry is, is you have to have a clear title a descriptive title, short title, Pinkalicious, Angelina, Fancy Nancy. You have to have a fantastic image. You have to have really good artwork that's compelling that you can see from a distance if it's gonna be on a poster. I, I can't stand cursive poster art. You, I can't read it. I can't read it when I'm in front of it. You know, uh, It's gotta be block letters so I can read it. I wanna see the name or the company. I wanna see the image. And then as soon as we can, I mean, I've actually hired actors to put costumes on. You need photography, you need good photography. And then as soon as you've got your production up, you've got a videotape. And, you know, especially now EPK, an electronic press kit, nobody sends, you know, when I was doing press in New York, we had black and white pictures that had stuff typed on them that we mailed around to every, you know, news outlet in the city or in the country. And now it's all electronic. So you have to have clear, good, a sizzle, they call it a sizzle reel, you know, like what's your 30 second reel? And nobody wants to watch the whole movie. Nobody wants to watch the whole show. I mean, some people do. Some people say they can't book it unless they can watch the whole thing, whether in person or on video. But something that says, hey, this is hot. It's sexy. It's fun. Even for kid shows, it's it's fun. The kids audience reactions at North Carolina. I think it was a magician or somebody had a reel where it was shot from the back of the house and you could see the audience and him performing. And there was a couple of times where he did something and the kids turned to each other and you could see their wide eyes and their smiles. And that was like genius because I mean, I want to book that show. Like if my audience is going to react like that. So, and then you have to have a description. We're known as Vital Children's Theater. I had an, uh, an advertiser say, oh, we're going to do some photos of your company, get a bunch of kids and put them on stage. I'm like, no, 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 we don't do that. We, we're, a, we're professional adult actors performing for children and their families. So you have to be very specific about what you do so people don't you know, think, oh, we don't do kiddie theater. Or, you know, we have somebody in our, our town does the community theater. No, this is professional theater. I'd like to go into this time machine that I, I invented. <laughs> and we're going we're gonna to go back for just a few minutes to, to meet with Stephen, who is just about to declare that major. And you've got a few minutes to give him some advice, knowing what you know now. Just curious what it is that, that you would tell him. What's coming to mind is follow your bliss. Make sure you're doing something you're passionate about. I mean, I loved theater. I never thought it could be a job. And then I finally just committed to that. It, when you're doing what you love, it's not a job. When I started my company in New York, we had a theater on 42nd Street on Theater Row, and it was six in the morning. I had worked the night before really late, and I stuck the key in the door and I turned the key and I was like, oh my God, I'm walking into my own theater in New York City. I love this. Follow your bliss. I can't, I can't stress that enough. I, we're about to wrap up soon, but I just want to go back to the very beginning of our conversation when you were going through that list of all the different types of jobs you had and how when you finally got to where you are now, you looked back and said, wow, I learned so many things from each of these parts. How important it is, is it for someone in theater to be open to that? Because I've met a lot of theater people that they have that end goal. They know what they want to do at one point but what they're doing now isn't their passion, and so they're not really paying attention. You know, theater is an apprenticeship. Like any business, as you get in a room and you work with other people, and I tell people this too, I've worked in summer stock, I've worked in dinner theater, I've worked in professional theater, I've worked all over New York, I've worked in film and TV. In theater, the more jobs you have, to understand how theater is made, like anything, the more invaluable you're gonna be. If you're an actor, if you, Ibsen, Henrik Ibsen, one of the most famous playwrights, he spent, 
I think 20 years as a stage manager before he wrote his first play. And he could not have become the playwright that he was without having studied the drama of that period of that time. So just get as much experience, whether you're, whether you're building sets or helping with costumes or stage managing or running crew backstage, all of that stuff is invaluable. Watch and listen and pay attention because it's all gonna come in handy sometimes. That's fantastic. I'm just gonna take a second to um, ask you if there's any other pieces of wisdom that you'd like to impart on a young person thinking that they maybe want to become uh, a producer or even an agent or something, some other type of colleague that maybe we haven't talked about already. You know, I do have advice for young people. If you're looking, if you're interested in something, reach out to that person, reach out to somebody in that industry, find somebody who knows someone in that industry. If you're interested in something, ask somebody, ask your professor, ask your colleague, ask somebody in the industry, like, how do I do this? Or how can I get in, you know, I do, and this industry is incredibly supportive. You know, in Napama, the North American Managers, Presenters Organization, whatever that crazy long title is, is they call it coopetition, that we all are competing for the same jobs, but we cooperate in a way that's invaluable for everybody. We share knowledge, we share experience, we share jobs, we share opportunities. So. It's a, it's a great, great community to be involved in. And just, you know, ask, ask and, and, and go in with your eyes open. Fantastic. The last question I always ask, what do you like most about working in the industry today? What's keeping me going is I think about theater. You know, theater's been around since the beginning of the time, beginning of time, that, that as human beings, as a society, we've always had this need to gather and which we couldn't do during the pandemic, whether it's music, whether it's art, whether it's a museum, whether it's theater, that is always gonna be a part of our nature. And that's, you know, it's not Zoom theater, it's not TV, it's not film, it's not TikTok. It's what you and I are doing right now. We're in a room, in person, having a conversation, whether it's, you know, I'm telling you stories about my life or about my experience. That's never gonna go away. And I think that's that's my hope, is that we'll always have this opportunity to do this. Are we gonna make money doing it? Who knows? But, you know, I, as long as, you know, as long as I can keep doing this, this is, this is, that's my passion. That's what I want to do. Stephen, thank you. It's been a joy sitting here talking with you. I appreciate you sharing your stories with us, and and we'll keep following Vital, and and hopefully you'll still be hanging on to those strings. Cause... We'll we'll be here. Thank <laughs> thank great. you for inviting me. This is great. I really appreciate it. It's great to be here. Well, we're back, and I'm gonna let you guys talk while I eat this delicious cupcake. <laughs> Uh, speaking of those cupcakes, that's my exact experience of of meeting Stephen as well as seeing the tower of little pink cupcakes and going what are these and being, and then, you know, I've known Steven ever since. I also have been drawn in and that's how I've met some of my closest friends is actually through that booth specifically, uh, Kathleen Toner, who then mm. introduced me to Christine Cox, who, uh, who we're all great friends with. Um, and that's all because of the Pinkalicious booth and the little fairy wand or fancy Nancy wand or whatever <laughs> it was that they gave to us. And then, um, and then later on down the line, Steven gave me a Pinkalicious book for my daughter, um, which we wore out the pages on, honestly. I have a lot of respect for people like Steven, like just hearing a story of like going to New York with $200 in your pocket. Like I always had, I always had thoughts of like doing that when I was younger, but like never had the courage to actually do that. That idea of just being like, yeah, I got a couple hundred bucks. Like I'm just going <laughs> to move away from home. Uh, terrifies me to this day it terrifies me well and to a place like new york city where i'll crash on my friend's couch until i get on my feet and that's just wild yeah and it's not like you're the first theater company in new york <laughs> yeah. right it's like you you have to make it I, I, you have to make a name for yourself too you know i mean there's there's a lot of up-and-coming uh theater companies in new york and and finding a way to set yourself apart in that market I can't imagine. And I, I loved his marketing approach because it's so true. I mean, how many posters or, and artwork have you seen where it's script and it it's like, what does that say? But I, you know, his approach to just block letters, not overthinking it, um, and and his his marketing does really stand out. I mean, we've all we're all talking about how we were drawn into his booth by all these pink cupcakes or a pink fairy wand or a book or, I mean, there's there's a lot to that. I mean. Marketing is a focus for Stephen specifically that Stephen, you know, he talked about how he still does marketing for other people as a side job. If I had that kind of an interest specifically in marketing and it was something I enjoyed that much, a side job would, would still be fun because it's something to tackle and something to approach like that. Also, too, their model of being a producing theater by going after the book that they want to produce you know, to me feels like it would be too hard to even take off from to get to get the rights from somebody else. I found it 
like really interesting to know that it's possible and that, you know, those deals can still be profitable for everybody involved. For some reason, there's something about kind of like going up against a rights holder or trying to negotiate with that person, maybe not against. It sounds really challenging. And I mean, kudos to him for I mean, how many how many titles does he have at this point? And and they're all great. Brian, you kept referencing Stephen's many titles during the course of the interview. And then he, you know, had some advice regarding being a really be focusing on being a multifaceted arts administrator, which I think is some of the best advice uh, Stephen could give anybody who's been in this industry for a long time can give to somebody that's coming in or emerging talent is learn every aspect of your business because you never know what skill set you're going to need, where you're going to find yourself, how you need to support yourself. You might have to work box office. You might have to end up doing marketing for a small company. You might have to run a light board at some point in time because somebody is sick or that's just the position you find yourself in. So when I work with young people, I that's the same advice I give them is learn as much as you can and don't be afraid to take an opportunity to learn a different facet of the industry because you don't know how it's going to serve you in the future. Well, and look at you know how he got on his feet initially in New York was he went back to the same job that he had in high school, which was at a pizza place. Whenever you look at the business model of a pizza place, so much of that is about customer service. And that ties directly into a producing theater in front of house management and that all experience across the board, whether it's in performing arts or not, can be 100% applicable to your future goals. Not to overlook any opportunity as, oh, it's just a job for now. There's so much you can learn in any situation that you're in if you're paying attention to what's going on around you and how the business is working and what things are being focused on. That's very true, Josh. I also wanted to ask him, but I I didn't get a chance to follow up, how he found that pizza job, because I know it's probably not easy to find pizza places in New York. (laughs) 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 Brian, I appreciated you diving into sort of the the business of his business, um, because I, I I think what's crazy is that after so many conversations with Steven and seeing him at a different conferences and talking about him, it never really clicked that Steven is essentially a, a self-represented artist. Um, I always saw because they, like, he always had products that he was essentially, you know, or different um, books or different things that he was, you know, essentially selling that it never really clicked to me that I was like, oh, like this is what they're creating. This is what they're producing. But then also the process that they were taking to be able to do that, I think is really was I found really interesting and taught me a lot just by listening to that interview. When I first met him, I I thought he was an agent. I thought it was his yeah. agency and he was an agent. I, it took me some time to realize that he's the producing artistic director. In crafting a production, one of the first things he thinks about, even before the production is on its feet, is the marketing of it. He'll go outside of even the casting and, and just get some actors in the costumes themselves and get the costumes of photography so that he can start building marketing materials before the rehearsals even start. I think Stephen does that because he understands from the presenter side of things that as presenters, we need really clean, clear assets that are going to work for us as well. So you talked about the electronic press kit and how that whole dissemination process of marketing materials has changed. Um, So I, I really did appreciate that he seemingly thinks about it from the presenter side of it, from the artist side of it, and from, you know, his company side of of what that process is and what works in different markets, how that's going to be disseminated across to different presenters who are booking the shows and that sort of thing. And you have to understand both sides of the equation to make it work. So I was actually kind of hoping to take this conversation back to one of the themes that we've, we've started to talk a lot about on here, which is the future of the industry. And, uh, you know, Stephen mentioned that he was an actor who became a director, who became um, this artistic producing director. And, you know, the thing that he didn't talk about and was humble to the point that he didn't talk about it was when you're in that position, you're providing employment for other artists. And, you know, as, as people who are coming into the industry in, you know, no matter what their entry level is, um, it doesn't have to be, you know, artistic actor to director. And that's, not necessarily the path for everyone, but you know, like marketing associate to marketing director or any way in that you have is that if you're building a career that will ultimately be something that supports, you know, other people's artistic pursuit, I think that that's such 
a great thing to keep into perspective because I'm sure when he started, he was just thinking about being an actor. Um, but there's something to me that's like so beautiful about being so passionate about the art and then being able to give other people paying jobs. Following up on, on that, TYA for a lot of performers is one of their first professional performance experiences. Um, and, and that's where a lot of careers develop out of is getting time in front of audiences in a professional setting and that it's a, a, a wonderful and valid entry point because you learn so much from a children's audience with their brutal honesty and responses. <laughs> it And it's just as rigorous of a touring process and a rehearsal process and audience interaction process, right? So it absolutely is a valid entry point and anyone that has done that will... I think, tell you that they really cut their teeth there and learned what they needed to know to move forward, whether, you know, it's a a regional touring company or kind of a national touring company. Um, A lot of times we think of TYA as not being as high of quality or, you know, theater for young audiences being as high of quality or something, but it absolutely is. Well, and for those, um, you know, for what Steven's doing that are based on titles and then they're going off and selling the production rights to those scripts, those artists are originating those roles. And I mean, that's not something that you take lightly either. I mean, to be the, to be the original actors in a show is an awesome honor. Yeah. And I also think the flip side of that, like from the audience perspective, is that for those kids, like for some kids, that is their introduction to the arts and is the first time that they might see that as like, oh, I can do that in real life. Like, that's what I want to do when I grow up. And so it's very important to have those kind of experiences and to have actors and companies that are producing that. Well, I want to thank Stephen for sitting down with me. Uh, He was on his way to a PA presenters event over in Bethlehem at the Steel Stacks, and he was able to stop here at Kutztown and and was able to show him the theater, and and we got to sit down and chat for this interview. uh, I really enjoyed it, and I hope you all got something out of it too. Until next time. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening to There's No Business Life. Our producers and hosts are Brian Zelmer, Josh Benson, Kevin Maynard, Katie Miller, and me, Danielle Van Hoek. Views expressed in this podcast are ours alone and are not reflective of the organizations we are a part of. Keep up with us at nobusinesslife.com. There you'll find links to all of our episodes and socials. If you like this podcast, give us a like, a follow, a review, or our favorite, a five-star rate. Oh, wait, what was that site? <laughs> I got it. Don't worry. It is no business like. Dot com. Do I sound out bus I miss every time I type it? Yep, sure do. Stay in touch, my friends. For something pretty special, which you'll have to take a listen to the interview to hear it. Was it a cupcake? <laughs> <laughs> I love that.